The Cold War threatened the world with nuclear annihilation. Amid escalating tensions, the Soviet Union faced an espionage nightmare that could cost them the atomic race. American spy planes, soaring at extreme altitudes, were unveiling their nuclear secrets, capturing images of their hidden silos, even those tucked away in Siberia's remote, frozen expanses. American pilots had learned a pattern. Lone railroads and desolate roads apparently headed nowhere often led to Soviet nuclear facilities. The Soviets were pressed against the clock. They needed a clandestine method to transport 25-ton nuclear intercontinental ballistic missiles across their sprawling landscapes without leaving the faintest trail for their American adversaries to find. Their solution was nothing short of spectacular. Enter the Miel Mi-12, a colossal contraption the size of an airliner fused with the versatility of an airlift helicopter. When unveiled at the Paris Air Convention in 1971, it shocked the world. There had never been anything like it. The alarm bells rang in the U.S. as strategists tried to unveil the purpose of such a staggering machine. After World War II, it became clear that controlling the skies was pivotal to dominating a battlefield. For the U.S., advanced combat helicopters became the backbone of their operations worldwide. But for the Soviet Union, it was more than just military hardware. It was a lifeline. Their vast, sprawling territories needed unification, and the helicopter was not just another vehicle. It was the thread binding the USSR together. In places where other machines met their limits, helicopters could ascend, making the once uncharted and remote lands of the USSR accessible, turning impossibilities into new opportunities. This wasn't just about transport. It was about nation-building. By the 1960s, Soviet prowess was evident. They were crafting helicopters that not only matched, but surpassed global standards. However, as the tensions of the Cold War escalated, the looming threat of discovery by American spy planes made their missions not just a matter of technical proficiency, but of existential significance. American intelligence, with eyes in the sky, was pinpointing the once concealed locations of Soviet ICBMs. The Soviets, in their attempt to remain covert, had embedded these launch sites deep within nature's sanctuary. The primary means of transporting these behemoth first-generation nuclear missiles was railways, which inadvertently became trails, leading the U.S. straight to their secrets. Realizing this vulnerability, the Soviets knew they had to innovate or be exposed. They hatched a seemingly impossible plan, airlifting these colossal weapons. Using helicopters would make the locations unpredictable and nearly invisible to the prying eyes above. But there was a catch. The strongest helicopter at the time couldn't handle even half the weight of a 25-ton ballistic missile. The challenge was immense. To conceptualize, design, and engineer a helicopter unlike any before, a titan at the skies with the power to carry twice the weight of any of its predecessors. The stakes were monumental, the pressure palpable. Their future as a nuclear superpower was now in the balance. The Soviet Union, while a fearsome nuclear military power, was economically strapped. If they were to create the largest, most powerful airlift helicopter in the world, they would have to find a way to make it budget-friendly. Soviet engineers were far from greenhorns in helicopter design. They had a legacy of crafting mammoth rotorcrafts, with the impressive Miel Mi-6 as their crown jewel. As they embarked on this new, uncharted challenge, the Miel Mi-6 was their foundation. Their initial blueprint was straightforward. Scale up the already monumental Miel Mi-6, which at that time was not just the helicopter with the most formidable lift capacity, but also the world's fastest. Their vision was to amplify its stature and incorporate a second rotor engine in the rear, creating a giant tandem configuration helicopter akin to the Boeing CH-47 Chinook. However, turning this vision into reality proved to be an uphill battle. Prototypes faced calamitous design flaws. The exhaust from the forward engine was ingested by the rear rotor engine, leading to dismal performance and a slew of complications. Facing this tandem layout dilemma, the Miel Moscow helicopter plant innovators took a radical pivot. Rather than concocting a whole new aircraft, they sought financial prudence. They decided to reuse the Miel Mi-6's transmission systems and rotors marrying them to a sprawling fuselage evocative of a colossal airliner. Yet, 
instead of conventional aero-configured wings of an airliner. The MI6 rotors would be perched on the ends of an approximately 100-foot span of inversely tapered wings, introducing an ambitious transverse system configuration. This unconventional design wasn't entirely novel. Early helicopter blueprints sported transverse systems like the Focke-Wulf FW-61, Focke Achelis FA-223 Draca, and Kamov Ka-22 Vintacryl converter plane. These crafts were spellbinding hybrids of planes and rotorcrafts. As the Soviet Union grappled with its airlift challenge, this transverse system configuration emerged as their best hope to birth the world's largest helicopter. In 1965, in the heart of Panki, the meticulous task of breathing life into a pioneering prototype took flight. This wasn't a straightforward journey. It began with exhaustive trials of test rigs, intricate mock-ups, and a sophisticated transmission system. Each fragment of this colossal machine demanded its independent prototype rigorously tested to perfection. Though the airframe carried echoes of the familiar, its construction was anything but ordinary. The body's foundation was a tensioned skin, while the high-strength elements were artfully sculpted from monolithic metal blocks. Within this expansive fuselage, he had a cabin measuring a staggering 28.15 meters in length, 4.4 meters in width, and 4.4 meters in height. A compartment cradled the captain's deck up front, housing the pilot, co-pilot, and an ensemble of engineers. The rear proudly displayed clamshell doors that, when unfurled, revealed a meticulously angled cargo ramp, complete with integrated, retractable supports. An array of doors adorned the fuselage to streamline access to the behemoth's belly. Dominating its skyline was an imposing fin and rudder, complemented by an elegantly proportioned dihedral tailplane. Sturdy, paired wheels held this Titan aloft, intricately connected to the heart of the fuselage via a network of robust struts fortifying the rotor systems and wings. Supplementing this were a pair of bumper wheels and steadfast support pads, ensuring the cargo ramp was precisely aligned. The aircraft was fitted with state-of-the-art electric hoists that could glide along beams or work seamlessly with a forklift to facilitate cargo maneuvering. At the juncture where the aircraft's main body met the horizon, the wings took prominence. These were no ordinary wings. They were crafted with an inverse taper, a design choice that expertly reduced drag and maximized lift. Attached to them were the primary rotors, each boasting an impressive 35-meter span. These rotors functioned in perfect harmony, with interconnecting shafts ensuring their synchronized operation. Each rotor spun in opposite directions. The port rotor turned counterclockwise, while the starboard one turned clockwise. This counter-rotation guaranteed a stable flight without the need for a tail rotor. Powering the largest helicopter in human history were twin Solovyev D-25 VF turboshaft engines. These engines churned out a combined might of 28,600 horsepower, dwarfing the power of many prominent helicopters. To put it into perspective, the Sikorsky CH-53E Super Stallion, one of the most robust production helicopters, generates around 13,650 horsepower from its three engines. The design thoughtfully included expansive access panels, which can serve as platforms for service crews. An equally intriguing aspect of the V-12 was its landing gear. Instead of resembling the conventional gear of helicopters, the V-12's underbelly featured a twin-wheeled nose unit, complemented by five primary landing gears, each equipped with four wheels, making it look more akin to a heavy cargo plane's landing system. Piloting such an aerial marvel was a complex and demanding endeavor. The flight deck housed the pilot and co-pilot and offered an expansive view. Steering the B-12 involved a nuanced system that required extensive training to master adequately. When the pilots provided input, it initiated a cascading response. This began with direct mechanical actions, transitions through an intermediate system armed with low-powered hydraulic boosters, and culminated at the high-powered actuators near the main gearboxes. Considering the aircraft's sheer size, structural flexibility, and the significant frictional forces at play, this sequential control system was paramount. In 1968, when the original prototype was completed, the main obstacle for the program was finding the best training protocols so aspiring pilots could grasp the unique and complicated systems inside the massive helicopter. Although plagued by intricate controls, the MI-12 prototype soared beyond expectations, 
effortlessly accomplishing its envisioned cargo capacity of over 25 tons. Soon after, it secured eight world records, as acknowledged by the Federation Aeronautique Internationale. The helicopter achieved unparalleled success in scaling diverse altitudes with escalating cargo weights. Impressively, three of these records remain undefeated. From May to June 1971, the pioneering B-12 prototype, SSSR-21142, embarked on a riveting European tour. Its pinnacle was a grand appearance at the 29th Paris Air Show in Le Bourget, donning the exhibit code H833. Its staggering dimensions took the world by storm, making an unequivocal statement. The Soviet Union had birthed the largest of helicopters. The dimensions of the V-12 are hard to grasp without seeing them firsthand. The rotor diameter extends to an impressive 114 feet 10 inches for each twin rotor, surpassing even the wingspan of the renowned Boeing 737, a mainstay in commercial aviation. Regarding weight-bearing capacity, the V-12 boasts a maximum takeoff weight of approximately 231,485 pounds, putting it on par with the maximum takeoff weight of a Boeing 757-200, a full-size commercial jetliner. Though the V-12 stretches to about 121 feet 5 inches, making it slightly shorter than an Airbus A320, its interior paints a picture of sheer enormity. The helicopter's spacious cabin can accommodate an entire missile system, or even two full-size buses highlighting its potential as a heavy-lift vehicle. The Soviets accomplished what seemed impossible. They'd found a solution to their nuclear delivery dilemma. Still, by the time the helicopter was ready for production, that problem no longer existed. The genesis of the world's largest helicopter had been driven by a pressing need to outwit American reconnaissance planes from detecting the location to the Soviet Union's clandestine nuclear silos. Yet, by the time the helicopter was ready for action, its foundational purpose had evaporated. In 1959, the Americans launched their first spy satellite into orbit. In a single day, this satellite could capture more images of Soviet territories than all preceding spy plane missions combined. This technological leap made it significantly more challenging for the Soviets to conceal their ICBMs. Fast forward to the 1970s, and the Soviets innovated a new breed of intercontinental ballistic missiles. These were compact enough to be truck-mounted, and their mobility made them elusive targets for overhead surveillance. Against this backdrop, the B-12, with all its awe-inspiring dimensions and capabilities, began to appear superfluous. It was a behemoth designed for a particular purpose, but outside of that niche, its utility was questionable. The world rarely required a single helicopter, capable of transporting 44 tons of cargo, or 200 passengers. By 1974, the curtain fell on the B-12's journey. While American intelligence was still debating the possible ramifications of the Soviet's massive helicopter, with only two prototypes in existence and numerous technical issues yet to be addressed, the project was shelved. The Soviets focused on conceiving a new heavy-lift helicopter, this time with a more traditional single-rotor design.